You guys have your Bible, Acts 2, we got it? Acts 2, if you have it, say amen. amen. If you don't have it, say have mercy. If you don't have a Bible, wow, a lot of people don't have it, all right, I'll wait. <laughs> if you don't have a Bible, you can get one right in front of you, there should be one. We use the English Standard Version, it's the version I think is best for preaching and studying the Word of God, but um, um, the best version is the one you actually read, right? So I hope you guys are reading the Bible at home and not only here. Um, but Acts 2, guys, God has been speaking to me um, tremendously. Um, I know that prayer is something that we're trying to emphasize in this church, and God has been speaking to my life tremendously, changing me and molding me, and that is exciting news for you guys. Why? Because the more God speaks to me, the more he speaks to you. Um, God has chosen me to be a vessel in his hand so that I can speak his words, so I can preach the word of God to you guys. So I hope you guys are excited for this message because it really was something that God put in my heart. And uh, you guys don't seem excited. Yeah. You, you All right, good. All right, awesome. Okay. So, so Acts 2. Um, who in here ever attempted to learn an instrument? Raise your hand. Ever attempted to learn an instrument? Okay. You, you guys have learned. You guys can raise your hand. You guys learned one, right? Okay. How many of you failed? Okay. Okay, see, there, see, that's what happens sometimes. Um, I'm actually teaching this, well, I was teaching this one kid how to play drums. And I'm teaching him drums, and, um, and he's getting good, actually. He's, like, picking up. He's, like, six years old, and, and he's getting the beats down, and he has rhythm. But all of a sudden, he just gets frustrated. And he's, there, he's like, I don't want to do it. I'm like, man, you could do it. I know you can do it. And he's like, I don't want to do it. And he just starts, like, yelling and, like, not wanting to do it. And his dad comes and beats him, and then he starts doing it good. <laughs> but, but the point is, he didn't want to do it. He didn't have the motivation to do it. It was tough. It, you know, it takes effort. It takes practice. It takes time. Right now, now, who in here loves church? Okay, hopefully everyone's hand is up. If it's not up, then hopefully by today you will love church. Okay, church planning is exciting, it's awesome, but unfortunately it is very hard and you need a lot of time and efforts and with that comes a lot of pain. I mean, guys, who wants to see people come to Christ here? Who wants to see people saved? Yeah, it's like, yeah, I'm excited, right? But when people become Christians, it brings a lot of joy, but it also brings a lot of sorrow. It brings a lot of pain because... We don't expect people to change from one night to the other. It's you become a Christian and it's a process, right? It's a process that we go through and you have to deal with that person's sin. You have to deal with that person's struggles. You have to deal with the person's past and the, the people that they're involved in that they need to just let go of. And, and many times those things are painful to deal with. So we're going to see that church planting, the church, Christ, it's awesome. It's awesome. We're going to see at the end when, when we see Jesus again, and, and it's going to be amazing, but that process of getting there is very tough. Just like that guy, who, that kid who wants to play drums. It, it's awesome. He's going to be able to play someday, but the process is very frustrating. So we're going to read. We're going to start in verse 37 of chapter 2. And it says, now when they heard this, right, Peter just finished preaching a sermon to all of these people. And it says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from, the cro from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls people came to Christ after one sermon. That just blows my mind. I'm just like, wow. That was like Billy Graham, but back then, 3,000 was a lot of people. That could be a whole city almost. So he preaches, and people are being baptized. Guys, picture this with me. Jerusalem and 3,000 people being baptized. In Jerusalem, they had a lot of pools, a lot of places where they can actually go and be baptized. Imagine 
50,000 people being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. People saying, I'm going to let go of what I used to be. I'm going to let go of my sin. I'm going to step in and walk with this Savior that gave his life for me. I mean, just picture that. 3,000 people doing that. Now, there were only 12 apostles. Now, my question is, how were they going to disciple 3,000 people? Right, 12 leaders, 12 apostles, 12 men that, that God called, that Jesus called himself, and 3,000 people, plus the 120 that was already with them. So 3,120 people, that's the beginning of the church. Now the apostles, they have to disciple. How did they do it? See, there's a danger in church sometimes. Church can end up becoming a never-ending project just to meet a goal that seems impossible. See, the danger of church is this. When church becomes something that you just do and do and do, all right, write the sermon, boop, check, all right, get ready for the kids' ministry, check, all right, we got the songs ready, check, all right, we got the lights, all right, check, we're all right, all right, we got the bulletins, check, we're all right, we got visitor cards, check, and we keep, it's just this thing, this motion, it's like just this factory with an assembly line, and it becomes something that we just do, not something that we are. That's the danger of some churches. You step in and you participate and you leave and you just check it off. All right, I'm done with church. I'm going back to my other ways. It's like a factory. But this is the thing. We're going to read four things that they focused on in the beginning of the church. And I think this is a model for our church here. This is our vision. So this is the first time you're here. Welcome. And this is a perfect time because I'm going to share with you the vision of this church and what God wants us to do here. So I've been reading this book called Total Church by Tim Chester and Steve Timmis. It's an amazing book, and uh, it's awesome because God gave me a vision for this church, and um, sometimes I sound like I'm crazy just, just saying it out loud, but then I begin to read authors who are writing the same stuff, and then I read scripture, and it's the same stuff, and I'm like, wow, well, this may be from God. I think this is from God. 100% sure this is from God. So the question we're going to answer today is, what makes up a healthy church? Okay, I entitled the sermon, Real Church. What is a real church? You can visit many churches and you can feel welcome and you can love it, but there's some things that many churches miss that we need to focus on today. So we're going to start in verse 42. And I'm going to read the entire passage, 42 to 47, then we'll go back and talk about the four points here. <clears throat> it says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Okay, so, so let's go back to 42, the first part. It says, and they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. All right, if you're writing this down, a first point is this. A healthy church is continually devoted to sound biblical teaching. Okay, first point is a healthy church is continually devoted to sound biblical teaching. Now, the terms used here means that they were continually devoted themselves. They continually devoted themselves to this teaching. Now, what did they teach? Because they did not have the Gospels this time. They did not have the Epistles. They didn't have the New Testament. They taught the Old Testament and how that connects with the ministry of Jesus. That's what they taught. And they were preaching the gospel. They were preaching how Jesus came to save the world, how he came and lived a perfect life so that you wouldn't have to because we can't, and that he came to redeem you from sin, redeem you from this crooked generation. They taught what Jesus taught. Now, I, I keep thinking about, you know, NBA players, man. NBA, I'm not really a basketball fan, but sometimes when I watch it and I see these NBA players and they're shooting from the free throw line and, and you know, it's a foul and they're hurt and they're just like... And it just goes. It just 
right, it's like 80% success rate, success, success rate, okay? 80%. And they're just like, swish, and then swish. I'm like, how do they do that? You know, do they just wake up and that's all? No, it's because they have continual devotion to what they do. They have that much success because they continually devote themselves to practice and they, and they practice and they keep going and they sleep and they wake up and they do it again and they, and they exercise and they go to sleep on time and they wake up on time and they devote themselves to what they do for a living. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Guys, beware of churches where the people don't carry a Bible. Now granted, sometimes we have our Bibles on our phones, which is okay. But beware of churches where the people do not carry their Bible, where they don't really preach the Bible. There's churches where they read one verse and they close the Bible and then everything is just, woo! It's like, wait, let's go back here. Let's go back here. I'm so glad our name is Pure Word Church. But let's live up to that name. I know many of you guys, you read your Bible and you're marking it up. But I, I encourage you, mark up your Bible. It's like, but, oh, but it's so nice. It cost me 50 bucks. It doesn't matter. All right? My dad, every, he gets a new Bible like almost every year. He marks it up. He color codes it and he writes in it and, and all that. And then by the end of the year, his Bible is falling apart, literally falling apart. He has to buy a new Bible, and then he mocks it up again, and it becomes your home, right? It becomes a place where you go back, and you know, man, last year, this verse got me through a tough time. And but maybe you're, you're writing notes during a sermon, and you know, oh, yeah, this is what I learned from this, this passage. And it becomes some place where you go, and you know exactly where things are, and it becomes your home. Mark up your Bible. Live the Bible and just study it. The more we study the truth, the more we will be able to discern lies. You know what they do when they try to um, find out if money is counterfeit? They, they study real money. They study how real money looks like. They, they spend hours looking and observing so that when they see counterfeit money, fake money, they know, wait, hold on, this is not real. In the same way, when we study truth, when we study the word of God, and then we hear lies, we, guys, not everything on TV, not everything on YouTube that you hear is truth. Let me just put it out there. Just because they have a big church does not mean that it's truth. And I want to equip you guys to be able to understand that I, I sometimes... When, when I see that many people are kind of following this one guy or woman or something that, that is kind of like, oh, not really biblical, then as a pastor, I feel like I need to say that like on the pulpit. But you guys should already know. You guys should hear, like sometimes I listen to these guys, I'm like, all right, I'm going to give it, you know, one sermon and, and see if they're legit and see if they're good. And I can't even get past 12 minutes because I'm like, lies, lies, lies. Why? Because when we read scripture, when we, when we study the truth, we encounter lies and we know it right away. Guys, many churches are afraid of preaching the truth because they are afraid of people leaving. There are people who left this church, and maybe you, some of you guys have been here when there were more people here, and they left the church because of this. See, they love my preaching. Oh, Tim, you are inspired by God. Oh, I love your preaching. But once I actually started putting the word to practice, they slipped out one after another. I talked to a guy last week, one of the guys that left, and he never told me why. He never, he just left with his wife, and um, he was telling me how he doesn't agree with church discipline and how I do things like that. And he was saying, church discipline, Tim, we should do things the way Jesus does, because Jesus loved everyone, and Jesus, so then I asked him, I'm like, oh, okay, when you discipline your children, do you do it because you love them or because you hate them? And he said, because I love them. I'm like, exactly. See, when we deal with sin in the church, it's not because we hate you, it's because we love you. Because we know that James says sin leads to destruction. So I was speaking to him, I'm like, 
man, like read scripture. Jesus is very clear about what we must do when it comes to sin. We must approach that person. We must love that person and say, brother, I don't want you to keep going down this road. Many times people, they love preaching. They enjoy listening to a good sermon. But when we begin to deal with these issues, that's when people don't like the word anymore. They like to pick and choose. But these people, these 3,000 people, they came to Christ in Acts chapter 2, and they devoted themselves to the word of God. That's what they devoted themselves to. They need to know. See, there are some churches even that they put the Holy Spirit above the Trinity. Okay? The Holy Spirit above the Trinity. Now, they're all equal, right? But let's think about what is the role of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance all that I have said to you. And John 16, 13 says, When a Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. The role of the Holy Spirit is to remind us of Scripture. The role of the Holy Spirit is to remind us of what the Bible is saying, what we are learning in church, so that when we read the Bible, when we read Philippians that we're going to get into next week, and we go on our day, we're going to approach something in life where the Holy Spirit is going to say, ah, remember what you read? I, I don't think you should go here. I don't think you should do this. And he's like, well, thank you, God. Thank you so much for keeping me in check. I've had people come up to me and say, but what about how I feel, Tim? You know, if I go to church and I just don't feel the Holy Spirit, I don't feel him moving. I don't know, I, I, something is wrong. You're, maybe worship has to be longer. or Maybe, you know, you can't cut it off at 1230. You just need to prolong it so I can feel the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, if, you, if all we want is emotion, we can stay home on Sundays and watch Titanic. If we want emotion, if that is what we're looking for, that is what we're going to get. Only emotion. If our emotions are not based on the living word of God, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. A healthy church will be devoted to sound biblical teaching, and that is when the Spirit works. That is when the Spirit works, when we read Scripture and the Holy Spirit begins to turn in us and begins to convict us and begins to change who we are, transforming our mind, renewing our hearts, doing all those things. Then it's like, then you have emotion because you see the person you used to be, you see the person you are today, and then that's when you begin to cry. That's when you begin to weep. That's when you begin to praise God because of what the Bible has done to you through the Holy Spirit. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? And that's also where my authority comes from. My authority as a pastor does not come from my role. It does not come from personality. It does not come from my gift of, of, of preaching. It comes only when I'm teaching the word of God. I was talking when we had prayer uh, uh, last Friday. We were downstairs eating some soup. And uh, I turned to you know, my brothers and I'm like, listen, uh, on Sunday, it could be like, I'm happy, right? I'm, I'm happy. I'm Mr. Happy Pastor, and I'm like shaking people's hands, and my life is great. But once we get into this circle right here, you really see what I'm going through. You really see who I am. I am no different than anyone else. I have my own struggles. I have my own sin. I need you guys just like uh, you need me. We need each other. So then once I begin to show other brothers who I really am, then they realize, Pastor Tim, he, he's just like us, but his authority only comes from Scripture. Only comes from Scripture. Kent Hughes, uh, he described his church as a Bible-believing church, but then Richard Wormbrand asked, are you a Bible living church? And that leads to our second point, 42b, second half. Um, and they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. It says, And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Okay, second point. A healthy church has true 
fellowship. Everyone say fellowship. Fellowship Fellowship literally means acting, the act of sharing. Sharing. Sharing is caring. All right. The root idea here is commonness or commonality. Um, On Thursday, during rehearsal, we were kind of all running late and... And I was telling Travis, I'm like, man, I didn't even eat. I'm eating like an energy bar right here, and, and we're like hungry. He's like, dude, don't worry, I got you, all right? We came in here, he had, he had a cheeseburger and a McChicken for all of us. Oh. Oh, no, I gotta do some marriage counseling now. Whoo, is it getting hot in here or is it me? Um, anyway, um, this is awkward. My point is that he brought it to us and we were able to eat and he showed us some cool things we can do with the burgers and it was awesome. But, but we received the food with glad and generous hearts. All right, it was amazing. It felt amazing to eat it. One time Cody, the guy on the camera right there, he invited John Carls and I over to his home and his grandma made some amazing German food and we ate it, and we ate it well, and we received it, the food with glad and generous hearts. See, we owe goulash, it was goulash. We, we overuse the word fellowship sometimes, right? We over, let's have some fellowship, let's just hang out. Let's just talk. Let's just do something, right? Let's hang out, and then we call that fellowship, but true fellowship costs us something. True fellowship causes something. See, selfish people, they'll come to a church or maybe a small group, and they'll leave, and sometimes they'll complain like, I didn't feel it. Mm-mm. No fellowship in there. I don't know. I, just, I didn't feel the love. I didn't feel the love. And it's like, hold up. Why, why do we? Truth is, it's always fellowship when we reach out to someone. Fellowship is when we, when we go into the church, when we go into these situations and we're like, how can I love someone? How can I make someone feel like they're loved? How can I reach out to someone in need? Many of us are selfish. Many of us are selfish. And we use church as something like, like self-medicating, like we should go there and feel good, when really we should go there and feel good about helping others and reaching out to others. Fellowship, that's what it is. Even when we don't have much, even when, when things are tough in our life, we are able to give, we are able to encourage other people. Guys, when Jesus taught the people, sometimes he teach them for days, like three days straight, and Jesus would teach them, but then right before they left, he would say, man, they're all hungry. It's been three days and they're all hungry. Let's feed them. Let's give. Fellowship costs us something. And let me tell you something very important. If you forget everything I say today, remember this. You cannot do it on your own. Turn to someone and say that. You cannot do it on your own. And say this, you need me. Tell them, you need me. And I need you. This is what a healthy church looks like. Total Church, the book I'm reading, gives a really good example. Let's say there's a couple in the church. All of a sudden, they get twins. Oh, man, what are we going to do? Now they have to take care of these two babies, and they have work, and they have all these things, so they can't really participate in church activities anymore. They can't really go anymore. Usually, churches would be like, okay, sorry. Maybe you can watch online or listen to the MP3, you know? A church that has fellowship and true fellowship like Acts 2, it would be different. It would have people going around this couple and saying, what can I help you with? And people would, would offer to babysit or, or maybe people would offer to take uh, one of them to, to work so they can have time in scripture and, and been praying on the way because they have to drive an hour to work. And the church goes around this family to help them. So they may not even come every Sunday because of so much activities, but they will be touched by the church throughout the week. And they will be loved. 
And that's exactly what Acts 2 is showing us here. It's don't, don't leave anyone behind. We are a family. We need each other. Let's help each other. Let's, let's sacrifice for each other. That is fellowship. Fellowship will cost us, and that is why we need Jesus. 1 John 1.3 says, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us indeed and indeed our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ guys don't think that you can have fellowship in the church by your own efforts because you're going to burn yourself out and you're going to hate it because you're going to love people that will not love you back you're going to give things to people that will leave the church and never even say thank you you're going to sacrifice your time for people that don't even care about your time but that is why we need Jesus, because he taught us how to give, because he gave the, the, the biggest thing someone can ever give, his own life, his own blood. And when we look at that, when we have fellowship with Jesus, we have the capacity, the, um, uh, the, the Holy Spirit that enables us to have fellowship with other people. And that is what we need. We need Jesus. So we must be devoted to the word, and we must have fellowship, okay? But what else? Let's go back to 42, verse 42. It says, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, and then to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Breaking the bread and the prayers. So the third point here, a healthy church worships Jesus. A healthy church worships Jesus. And they have two aspects here of worship. Obviously, there are many ways to worship. Worship is a lifestyle, but here they have two. Breaking the bread in prayer. So let's go through this real quick. Breaking the bread, what is this? This is the Lord's Supper. Many times people interpret this as a meal, and it could be a meal, but they also mention receiving food, which I think that's eating meals, but breaking of bread, which is what Jesus did. This is the Lord's Supper. This is a commandment. Now guys, do you realize that you cannot take part of the Lord's Supper alone? Did it ever go through your mind? You can't stay home and be like, I have a bread here. I'm going to break it. One for me, one for my imaginary friend. No. You can't do that. Some people view church as a social club. Yeah, I went to the Hillsong Conference. It was awesome. Passion. Woo! Yeah, you know, I, I don't really have a church. I just kind of go around, hop around, just checking things out. You know, we're all, we're all the church, right? We're all brothers and sisters of Christ. Right, I went to Bible study, yeah, I went to this Bible study. It's easy to love the church universally and to love people short term. It's easy to love people short term. But scripture shows very clearly that we need to commit to people. We need to commit to loving people who are stubborn. We need to commit to loving people who are just plain annoying. We, love, we have to commit to people who are loving and great and also annoying and, and, and frustrating and, and makes you pull your hair out. Amen. That is true love. It's easy to enter a church and see like, this church has too much gossip and sin. Like, welcome to the club, son. Welcome to the club. Come in. We're all, we're all sinful here, okay? But it's very clear that the, the New Testament shows local churches and, and people joining together like a family. And they met in homes, they met in a temple together, but they were together. Now, is it wrong to go to conferences? Is it wrong to go to different Bible studies and visit different churches? No, but m many times people don't commit to a, to a church, to a local church. That is very important in scripture. Some people are so against having buildings. They're like, ah, oh, the church is not a building. Like, I agree. But like, we, we only meet in homes. That's it. We only meet in homes. And it's like, well, it says here in verse 46 that they also met in the temple together. Sometimes they met in homes because they were being persecuted, so they only could meet in homes. You go in places like China, you don't see big, well, you do see big churches there, but some other places like India, where you don't really see churches like this. They, they're underground. They're, they're hiding, right? But thank God we have this building that we're not even paying for that my dad's church is blessing us with right now to get us um, you know, on our feet as a church plant. And we're able to come here together and, and do things and, and worship God together. 
So this is what I say, get plugged in to a church, whether it's this one or whether it's another one. If you're plugged in here already, then you're plugged in. But if you're not plugged in, well, I welcome you here. We need you. You need us. But if this is not for you, then go somewhere that you can get plugged in, where you can serve, where you can learn, where you can grow with other people. And then the other way is prayer. Prayer. Another way they worshipped was through prayer. And we focus on this last week, prayer. Guys, God has proven to me how powerful prayer is. Guys, prayer is what fuels the church. Prayer is what brings about change. Prayer is what defeats the enemy. Prayer is what strengthens God's people. And, and fasting has proven itself to be so powerful to me. It breaks chains. It gets you out of slavery. It gets you out of addiction. It gives you joy. It gives you peace. I always wonder, why don't I pray more? And then I look at Acts 2 and I see they devoted themselves to the Word of God. They devoted themselves to fellowship. And they devoted themselves to prayer. Prayer is what moves the church. Do you guys agree with that? Prayer is what moves the church, is what moves you. And, and I, my prayer right now is that if you're in a spiritual drought, if you feel like you can't, you know, it's been really tough living this Christian life, go on your knees. Fight the battles on your knees. I've been in places where, you know, living in a Christian home, my dad is a pastor and all these great things, living in the church, there were times where I felt so spiritually dry, like, is there even a God out there? But in those moments is when God wants you to come to him and say, I need you. I need you right now in my situation. Guys, let's be a church of prayer. Now, of course, worship is also done with music. Worship is also done when we collect like, tithes and offerings. Worship is done as a lifestyle. I recently uh, downloaded this app called K Love. Who in here knows Radio K Love? I love it so much. Melinda actually introduced this to me. They play it like um, in Delaware. And uh, when we come here, they don't really play it anymore. At least I don't think so. If you guys know it, let me know. But um, I'm like, maybe they have an app. So I, put, so I get this app and I wake up to it and I wake up with worship and whatever songs they're playing and it always speaks to me. I, I, I sleep with it, I, you know, when I'm getting ready, sometimes I'm, I'm even showering and I'm putting Caleb on and just listening to God. It, it's constant worship. It's constantly thinking of God and remembering his grace and remembering who he is. It's a lifestyle. Now, this all seems very inward focused, right? Inward it's teaching here, it's fellowship here, it's prayer here. Okay, so who in here knows our vision statement? Let's go. What is it? Good, taking the church to, but bringing, same thing, yeah. Taking the church to where the people are, okay? But everyone say it, taking the church to where the people are. Okay, so that's the vision statement. So we're going to see verse 47 how this works out. Verse 47. It says, Praising God and having favor with how many people? All. All people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. All right, so our fourth point here and last point, and I'll let you guys go. A healthy church focuses on evangelism. A healthy church focuses on evangelism. Many churches, they're growing inside and they're growing with themselves. They're making their own little world here, but they're not focused on the people outside. This is where the first three points connect to this fourth point. Some people cringe when they hear the word evangelism. Like, you want to go out and evangelize? Ugh. That word just seems, ugh. Right? You want to hand out tracts? You want to go out and hand out flyers and invite people to pure word? Ugh. Right? But, but let me paint you a better picture of evangelism, and hopefully you guys will, will be encouraged to evangelize. If our church does not focus on sharing people, sharing Jesus with the lost, 
We are wasting our time. What is the point of becoming super Christians and staying within these four walls? Wasting away our, our gifts, wasting away our knowledge of scripture, wasting away our prayers. We could be kneeling down and praying, God, send us people, God, save people, God, do things. But then we don't even step out of this. We don't step out of our comfort zones. Guys, I don't care how spiritual you might be. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how much you read the Bible. If we are not sharing the gospel with people, it's all a waste. Yeah, you'll go to heaven, but how about your friend? Yeah, you'll be saved, but how about your family? You'll be saved, but how about the people at your job? How about the people that you encounter every single day and they're smiling, but deep down inside they're hurting and they're dying inside spiritually? Now, this doesn't mean that every big church is doing it right. They added their numbers day by day. Wow, big churches, this is great. No, it doesn't mean that. But it also doesn't mean that if we're not getting new Christians every day, we are not doing it right. But it does mean that if we don't adjust our lives so that others will meet Jesus, then we are wasting our time. We are wasting our time. But this is, I wanna get into this evangelism thing. Notice how they evangelized. Did it say, and they handed things out and people were annoyed? No, it says they had favor with all the people. I read the message uh, version, it's not really a version, it's a paraphrase, but it says, people in general liked what they saw. Do people like what they see when they come in here? Do people like what they see when they see your life? Guys, there are many methods of evangelism. There are so many methods. You can buy books and you can watch pod, uh, listen to podcasts and watch videos. But do you know the best one? The best method? I know the best method. I had discovered it. In John 13, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. He repeats that many times. I think he's trying to say something. Love one another. Evangelism is most effective with love. Love. How will the world meet Jesus, how will the people in Southside Bethlehem meet Jesus? How will your friends, your family, the people you work with, the people you go to school with, how will they meet Jesus? When the people in the church love one another. What? But how do we show this? How do we show this? How do we show the world that we love one another? The first three points, the word of God, fellowship, and worship. Let me tell you how these three tie into evangelism. Let's think about this context real quick. 3,000 people are saved. All of a sudden, there's a great amount of love. This amount of love increases in Jerusalem. 3,000 people are baptized, and all of a sudden, people love these people. They didn't just love the people who were easy to love, they loved the people who were marginalized in society. They love the poor. They love the sick. They love the messed up. They love the addicted. They love the disabled and the criminals, the kinds of people that in order to love them requires them to believe in the word of God, that it can convict and change them, to fellowship in a way that caused them to show lots of love, and to worship a God who is faithful. Now just picture this with me. Step into their world real quick. Just picture a poor man and he's visiting, visiting his neighbor who's also poor, but who was saved in that sermon from Peter. He steps into the guy's house and he's hanging out with another man who happens to be Christian. And this man, though, he's wealthy. He's like up there in the social status. And he sees them hanging out, the poor and this guy who is wealthy, who never hanged out with the poor. His neighbor walks in and he's like, what are you doing with this guy? If you knew my neighbor, you would know that this guy is selfish and lazy. That's why he's poor right now. 
especially you, why are you hanging out with this guy? Now, now picture a woman going to see her sick sister and she goes to this house to visit and help her sick sister but then there is a Christian there helping the sick sister and she's like washing her feet and, and helping her. So this woman goes in and is like, why are you helping my sister? She's not even your family. Why are you doing this? Imagine 3,000 people studying the word of God all across Jerusalem, loving each other and sharing everything with each other and then worshiping together. What are the non-Christians thinking right now? They're thinking, okay, I see Bible, I see lots of love, and I hear the name of Jesus. I want to read that Bible, I want to experience his love, and I want to meet this Jesus. Pure Word Church, this is our vision. We take Jesus to where the people are. Let me explain. People need to encounter the church as a network of relationships instead of a meeting we do once a week. We create opportunities for the world to see how we interact with each other. They need to see how we love each other. This could just be hanging out at a coffee house. This could be going out to bowl. This could be playing video games. This could be going to the mall. While non-Christians are with us, they will see that we take the Bible seriously, that we live according to it, that it changes us, it molds us. They will see that we love and we forgive each other. We're actually real people. We don't pretend we have it all together. They will see us confessing our sin to each other and forgiving each other and loving each other despite all of our failures and sin. They will also see how we give all the credit to Jesus. They will say, I am this way because Jesus has done it in me. Let me tell you, most people are going to be attracted to the community first before they're attracted to the message. They're going to be attracted to this group of men, this group of women who are loving each other abundantly. And then, verse 43 says, And awe came upon every soul. Why? Because they saw how everything worked. Everything was consistent. People will experience the gospel way before we even preach it to them. They will be hanging out with other Christians and they will see this love. They will see this grace and mercy. So when they hear about what Jesus did, like that that sounds familiar. I felt that that kind of love before. Show me more about this Jesus. Because they're going to say, okay, I see Bible. I see lots of love and I hear the name of Jesus. I want to read that Bible. I want to experience his love and I want to meet Jesus. And the Lord added to the number, day by day, those who were being saved. We take the love of Jesus to them. Why are we going to create social clubs for people to join? Many churches are are set up so that you have to belong before you believe. Right, They, they step here into the church and they have to dress a certain way They have to speak a certain way. They have to behave a certain way because if they don't, they don't really belong. Guys, that's not how it is. They don't have to believe. They don't have to belong to believe. This is what it is. They should be able to belong before they believe. They shouldn't feel awkward hanging out with Christians because they don't talk like us, because they don't have Christianese, because they don't dress and behave like us. They should feel like they belong. So then when you hit people with that kind of love, Jesus says, all people will know that you are my disciples. So practical applications, what do we actually have to tell them the gospel? Yes, eventually we do. Eventually we have to sit down with them and share with them. Listen, this is what scripture tells me. This is what changed my life. I once was blind, but now I see. I once used to be this person, but Jesus made me a totally different person for his glory. I am changed. And I want you to be changed too. I want you to feel this love, this joy, this peace that I have in my heart. And I love you. You're my friend. You're my coworker. Whatever that person is, whoever that person is, I love you. 
and we tell that person the gospel. Do we still have to invite them to church? Yes, but it doesn't have to be the first time you meet someone, hey, come to church with me, because they may have a bad picture of church. I met this one guy at the gym, and it was amazing because he just came up to me and was like, I need new friends. All my friends are bad and taking me to the wrong path. Like, literally, I'm just like, I'm right here, man. He's like, yeah, I need to hang out with sober people. I'm like, right here, man. But I don't even want to tell him that I'm a pastor yet. Because I don't want to like, oh, you're a pastor? Pff, all right, that's why you're becoming my friend. No, I just want to be his friend. I just want to love him. I want to hang out with him. I want to show him what it means to be a Christian. I want to show him what it means to see love. So then someday when he hangs out with my friends, my Christian friends, and we'll begin to talk about Jesus and how God has been molding us and what God's been doing, or maybe we're confessing our sin, he's going to be like, I've never, ever seen this before in my life. So when he hears the gospel, maybe it's here, maybe it's one of us, maybe one of you guys are going to be able to share with him the gospel. He is going to give his life to Jesus, and he's going to be baptized, and he's going to be part of this church. Hang out with them. Build relationships. Build relationships. So the four points, continual devotion to the word of God. Mark up your Bible. Love it. Live it. Number two, fellowship. We need to be able to love each other first before we can ever love the world. Three, worship. When we sing these songs, it, is, it isn't about how you're feeling. It's about giving credit to Jesus. Saying he loves us. My life is chaotic right now, but he loves us. And the fourth is evangelism. Invite non-Christians to your circle of Christian friends and show them the love of Jesus. Let's not forget this, church. Let's take the people to where the people are. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads and, and pray to the, the Savior of the world. I want to invite you right now to meet Jesus if you haven't done so already. Maybe right now you need to be saved. You need, you're, you're just thinking, God, I need to be saved right now. I need you to forgive my sins. I want to start new. I want to start a new slate today. You can do that today. You don't have to live perfectly. That's impossible. That is why God sent his son to live a perfect life that we could not live and to die the death that we could not die. But he is alive today. And someday we will see him again. And I want you to join me in that. If that is you, I'm going to count to three. And I just want you to, I want you to include you in this prayer. When I say three, just raise your hand. You can shoot it back down. And by you raising your hand, you're, you're saying, you're telling me what's going on inside of your heart. Saying, I want this Jesus. You may not have it all together. You may not understand everything. But you just know right now in your heart that you want this kind of love. You want Jesus. If that is you, raise your hand on three. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he died for you, but now he reigns. Three, anyone? Does anyone want that? Amen. I see your hands. Anyone else? Anyone else? Amen. We've been praying for you. We've been praying for you. Just say this out loud, just where you are. Repeat after me and say this prayer. Lord God, I need you. I know that you are the savior of the world and I cannot do this on my own. I believe that you died and you rose again. Please forgive my sins and help me to live a new life for your glory. I love you and I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church? Why don't we clap and praise God for that?